Very good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Gronya Hamilton. I'm co-founder of Interchange. Um, and as Amanda said, I've done a lot of work in open, in various aspects of open. I think many of us tend to think of open only as open source. Um, in fact, in a, in a report that um, we released yesterday, we know that 64% of leaders um, from the public sector, we worked with 56 uh, leaders from governments, from um, government agencies over the last couple of years, and 64% of them had a perception of open that was really quite restricted to open source technology. But we know that open is a range of philosophically aligned approaches. We have open education, we have open, um, open recognition, open standards, open licensing, uh, and open culture. And my uh, fellow panelists today represent a cross-section of some of those other aspects of open. So why is, why is it open and why are open approaches important in terms of how we approach sustainability? When we think about sustainability and we look at the declarations made here at COP26, um, many admirable declarations, um, many solutions that on the surface sound sustainable, sound, sound great, sound like they're going to, to help us um, with the, the solutions we need to address the climate crisis. But are they truly sustainable? Is something truly sustainable if we don't have a social justice along with the, the climate justice? Um, that, that we're looking for. I'm a researcher of social psychology and um, public participation in environmental issues, Susanna Patel, um, while looking at renewable, the renewable energy transition, commented that the key problem is that the transition is being performed in the same model that caused the climate crisis. So we're using the same behaviours, the same approaches, the same systems to address and to change. Is that really going to help us develop the most sustainable solutions that, that we can and that are desperately needed? So how do we empower people, organisations and leaders to behave differently, to make systemic changes so that we can create truly sustainable solutions that benefit all of us? And how do we create the conditions to navigate the challenges and opportunities of possible, probable and preferred futures? There's a great quote by the Scottish naturalist and um, pioneer of the American system of, of American national parks, John Muir, who said, when we try to pull out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. We are connected. As we, as we um, drive our cars, we're having an impact on the planet. As we develop open source technology solutions, we're having an impact on others. If we're connected, if we're, if we're interconnected in this way, it makes sense, it seems, to harness that interconnectivity and to collaborate to develop solutions that include all voices, that include various perspectives, that help us to be adaptable, that develop community, so that we can ensure that we have developed the most robust and resilient solutions that we can. I think part of this is opening up our realms of awareness. And what I'm, I'm pleased to, to be discussing today with um, the, my fellow panelists is how approaches and principles that connect all of um, the open, open developments we've seen over the years can help us um, to, to meet this challenge. Open um, includes open source technology, as I mentioned, um, open standards, open innovation, and, and they're represented on our panel today. And so we're, we'll be discussing how these different um, aspects of open and the principles, the, the cultural conditions that connect them can help us to work better together. Um, how the behaviors and practices can help create conditions for rapid innovation, resilience, and sustainability. So when I talk about open principles, I want to um, give some background to where the open principles came from. Um, they were developed by a global community uh, of practitioners from all different sectors and, and backgrounds. 
and supported by Red Hat, um, an open organisation, um, in fact the, the inspiration for the book, The Open Organisation, this upstream community came together to define and articulate those core characteristics of open approaches and also what they were seeing in the open organisation of Red Hat, which was known for its ability to rapidly innovate, to engage, to, um, to use feedback and, and connection with community, um, to, develop, to develop robust solutions. And they developed the open principles. The five open principles are inclusivity, transparency, adaptability, community, and collaboration. And those principles are interdependent on each other. They, um, when used together, they, they build on each other. They can provide a foundation for new behaviors, uh, systems, and structures. To give an example of the open principles in practice, uh, last Friday I attended the um, Fridays for Future March in Glasgow. And it struck me how this was a wonderful example of collective action and the open principles in practice. So huge numbers of individuals and groups from around the world had connected and converged in Glasgow at a particular time, on a particular, on a particular day. They had um, come together around something they felt passionately about, um, aligned values over addressing the climate crisis. I could see many communities, banners from different groups, uh, different um, political backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different accents, and it was an incredibly inclusive, um, inclusive uh, group of people. How did they come together? Well, they respected many different voices and perspectives. They used transparent communication to ensure everyone knew that the protest, the, the march was happening on, on this specific uh, day in Glasgow. They developed communities. They developed a community of communities to bring these, these people together. And they um, adapted. So when the Glasgow weather blew over their stage on Saturday, they adapted and set up a new stage in a lorry. So those are the principles in action. When we, when we bring these open principles together, we know that we can have a voice. We can have a voice to be reckoned with. The young people that have been present um, and making their voices heard uh, at COP26 are now a force to be reckoned with. I think one of the, one of the things we can tend to do, though, is to, sort of, is to separate. We, we say there's the protesters and then there's the official COP26. There's... Um, there's the old form of, of, there's energy as it exists at the moment, I'm saying old form because we're moving towards new forms, but there's, there's energy as it is at the moment that's created the climate crisis, therefore they're bad. They're bad and renewable new energy is good. I think what we need to be careful about is that polarization of voices. In the end, if we want to, to come together and, and develop robust solutions, we are going to have to connect. We are connected anyway. We have an impact on the world. We are all powerful. Our voices are powerful. And we can, we can impact change through our behaviors. So I'd like to join the, join the panel. Um, and they're made up of uh, um, experts from across uh, the spectrum of open, as I mentioned. Um, we have open culture um, and open source technology represented with uh, Chris Bainham Hughes um, right at the end there. Um, beside him, we have Catherine Styler, who's the CEO of Creative Commons, um, who the, the open licensing, the global open licensing um, organization. And we have Salim Avan from the United Nations, um, who has been developing open approaches within uh, the context of the United Nations. So I'm delighted to join them. And as Amanda said, we will have an opportunity for, uh, for questions from the floor as well. Um, through this panel discussion. So, oh, I did what I wasn't supposed to do and, and bumped the mic there. So, hi everyone. Um, Celine, perhaps I could start with you. Um, from your perspective, what is the most important way that open can aid sustainability? Thank you. Um, so. I think the whole idea of being open, open source, and, and, and I think the way you described it in that very kind of expansive way, 
And I think we also need to think about technology in a very, very expansive way. Um, I think fundamentally coming from the United Nations, the whole, whole idea of open is very much embodied in the principles of the UN. The UN came into being on the basis of this kind of collaborative, coherent, multilateral approach to some of the most pressing challenges we have. The most pressing challenge we have at the moment, of course, is the climate, uh, the climate um, crisis, and the whole idea of sustainability. So as long as we can understand, and uh, I guess subscribe to the principles of open, as long as we can create awareness at a global level from a top-down perspective so that the member states are engaged, but also from a bottom-up perspective so people understand, um, that we can have a common vision, a common approach, a common direction, and really start sharing, co-creating, and collaborating together, we have the opportunity to try and figure our way out of this um, kind of climate situation. Um, I personally don't feel that we lack the technology. I don't feel we lack the will. I don't think that we lack the resources. I think what we lack is that idea of working, you use the word connected many times, uh, working together in a connected way. And open source and open in general allows us to do that with some sort of coherent structure towards a common goal. We use this phrase very often in the UN, you, if you go alone, you can go fast. If you go together, you can go far. And what we need to do is really go far together. So I really believe that that's what we really need to kind of embody. And I often use the word love. I think what we need to find and use really apply open to is the idea of love in the sense of trying to find a common narrative for the future, a common set of goals, uh, common principles, common ideals, and then really come together in that co-creative model to try and solve some of these issues and problems that we face. So that's um, not a very specific answer, but that's really what I kind of feel is the real core of uh, the, the open approach. Um, if I may, just one last thing yeah, I'll say. Absolutely. is um, So if you look at the UN Charter and the preamble to the UN Charter, I'm sure you guys have memorized it like me. Um, but it says, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war that is twice in our lifetimes brought untold suffering. So when they talk about twice in our lifetimes, they're talking about the two world wars. The most important thing there to me is we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations. And we are the succeeding generations. It was for our generations that those people that wrote the charter, they were working towards a better future for us and we have to do the same. So I think that's where we really need to kind of focus our attention and use that power of uh, an open, inclusive approach. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, perhaps I could come back, come, come to you next. Um, one of the things uh, I've discussed with people from Red Hat is the idea that open organizations need open people. And I think what Celine was just saying there about open behaviors and, and how that is what helps us, can help us collaborate and, and move forward. How, how, do you, um, how do you work with that idea of, of the open principles within, within Red Hat, for example, and how does it help you? All right, okay. So, yeah, so we could go in many different directions here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, community is a big thing. So um, bringing the community together to actually sort of take action uh, and bringing together those communities of practice um, uh, so that you have that, that kind of that common goal and then uh, having series of practices that allow us to the, you know, the, the points you made earlier, you know, tra uh, transparency, inclusivity, adaptability, and collaboration, um, you know, four out of the five, our practices sort of, you know, live, live those, um, those characteristics. Um, and that ensures that we get, you know, better solutions, and we're also driving towards a very, you know, common objective. So we might take a while to actually make, um, you know, come to a decision because we're, we're taking m many more ideas, but we have practices that allow us to, to turn that into direct action and actually take that action. Because you know, ultimately what we're talking about, and certainly with sustainability, is it's a, it's a complex problem. It's a really complex problem, and any solution that we have, have there's flaws to them. So when we have something that's a complex problem, we're into the point of having to experiment our way to a solution. You know, none of us have a crystal ball that can kind of, uh, you know, if we polish hard enough, we'll, we'll be able to see, see the, the, the right course of action. So we have to take, uh, you know, create hypotheses and design those experiments out and, and, and build out from there. So 
I think, um, you know, with, with, with that in mind, designing that experiment quickly and then taking to a point where um, you know that you're going to come out and assess the evidence and then change based upon that evidence is really critical. And that allow, allows you to get this kind of cadence between sort of thinking and doing, thinking and taking action, rather than getting stuck in that sort of analysis paralysis of, of um, you know, overthinking it or thinking, well, we, we've got to get it right first time, rather than we're going to, we're going to run an experiment, we're going to learn from that. So I think that's how, you know, using those, um, you know, practices and using those, those, those principles within a community allows us to sort of really take, take this forward. Yeah. Catherine, um, from your perspective, what's the most important way that open can um, help us develop more sustainable solutions? Well, I think the moment, um, which is, I mean, it's amazing sitting here and with all of you, and uh, it's wonderful actually to be here in a real event, in person, together. Um, and that togetherness, I think, is something that's really important about this is a shared problem. This is the world's pressing problem, and we're in Glasgow thinking and dealing with it from our perspective. And I think this is the time for open because we have a shared responsibility. And Chris touched upon, I mean, as we experiment, and we know time is ticking, you know, and we know in the room not far away from here, they're really, really grappling with that ticking clock. But all knowledge is built on other knowledge. And so what you're describing about, we need to test, we need to try things. I mean, at Creative Commons this week, we've, um, we were very proud to launch our, um, uh, our campaign um, to look at biodiversity and climate in terms of research and data, because we know so much of that is still closed. And we need that to be open, to be able to solve our pressing problems. So we're really proud to be working with uh, Spark North America and Eiffel to be able to address that issue in a campaign. Now, that might be something small and very specific, but that small and specific, opening up data, opening up research, is absolutely critical if we want to try and build knowledge and knowledge and share information to deal with this pressing problem. Now, you know, it's, it's striking to me that we still so many things that are closed and need that open approach. And I think we can show why that matters, why it's the right thing to do, and why now is the time to do it and, and, and share that in a much broader audience in a way which this is an opportunity through climate and sustainability to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, um, and I, think, I think open really sort of brings, it gives, it's very, open technology has been very good at bringing communities together. People are like-minded with, a, you know, a purpose and a passion starting from there. So they're, they're passionate about doing something. They want to sort of take action and bringing that community together and then having these enabling sort of frameworks and, and uh, you know, all the different enabling elements that allow allow that community to thrive um, asynchronously, or, or, or you have it to, to drive that forward and build that knowledge, build that, that you know, actually just get started and do something rather than you know too much hot air. It's it's you know it's getting to that point. Because you're absolutely right that we've got expertise in community building in ways which are really interesting mm. for others. And I think, again, sharing some of the things maybe we take for granted. Yeah. Um, actually, not just the kind of the, the, the knowledge building and knowledge, but actually the community building. You touched about community as well, some as well. What you were saying too is so critical. One of the, one of the experiences I've had um, with collaborating within a community uh, was to develop the um, open standard, open badges. And this was developed by a, a group of people that came, that, that, that collaborated on this from around the world never met. I didn't meet anyone else um, I worked with on that. And it was very much driven by a desire to, to improve something, to, to make yeah. something better. There's a recognition that, um, that learning, that, um, that recognition, that skills recognition was being siloed and siloed in formal education um, and that learning happens everywhere. So why wouldn't we have a, a standard for, for um, allowing us to, to recognize that? But what was, um, what was so powerful from that experience was um, seeing how a global community of completely unconnected people can come together, collaborate, and create an extremely robust solution that is now used by, I mean, if we take it down to just a sort of baseline of, 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 uh, of wealthiest com uh, companies in the world who are now using that to transform their skills and recruitment and talent pipeline processes. So, this is, you know, this, this I think comes back to, to the idea that open is um, able to help us develop resilient and robust solutions. And when we're thinking about sustainable um, solutions, we need to be including 
multiple perspectives because it is such a complex yeah, I mean, harnessing that purpose and passion, but also getting those different perspectives from yeah. literally from around the world. So the idea that, you know, my perspective on something would be the same as somebody who's living in you know, the other side of the world or, you know, in, 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 in Africa or, or where, wherever that wherever that may be is is naive. Really, You know, we, we're going to have we, we we need to have all those um, ideas coming in. And if you can harness that purpose and passion and give it a, a direction. And you know something like sustainability. There's a lot of passionate people around the world for this. We can harness that. I have no doubt that humanity can 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 address it. It's but it's about how do we how do we how do we harness that and how do we make that happen? Yeah, I think that's where we can really add a lot of value. Totally, totally agree. Uh, and we so to your point, um, we have these six UN official languages, um, and we think of data and technology as the kind of informal seventh. Um, and I think not only is it important to be able to understand those different perspectives from around the world, um, but it's very important to be able to engage younger people. And for them, they're very much you know, natives in this area. Uh, what I'll tell you is we did these two very interesting things. We did, um, we did these two hackathons, global hackathons. Um, one was called Reboot the Earth, one was called Reboot the Oceans. Um, on Reboot the Earth, we had one of the winning entries uh, had figured out a way to encode data in the DNA of plants. So instead of having a data center in some you know, building somewhere with cooling and heating and electricity, they were using plants to store data. Now, it may not be a bring to market technology, but the metaphor is very, very powerful. Uh, so I think that's you know, so the sorts of things that we wouldn't necessarily see if we didn't have that ability to have an open approach that invites everybody from around the world to engage into to, to kind of collaborate. There was another thing we did, which I'm reminded of, where we had built um, a model for electrification of Africa. And so basically it took uh, Africa and created these 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer squares, uh, had information about the demographics, the infrastructure, all this kind of stuff, meteorological information. Every time we ran the model, it took 50 hours to compute. Did a global hackathon, young women from India figured out a way to reduce that 50 hour compute time from 50 hours to five minutes. And to reduce the size of the squares from 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers to one kilometer by one kilometer. And this is not to say that we hadn't employed any smarts to get to this problem. This problem was solved, or we were trying to solve this problem between the UN, the leading university in Sweden, technical university, and one of the biggest private sector analytics companies in the world. But yet the solution came from an unlikely source. Mm -hmm. And she of course probably went off to go and work in a hedge fund and make tons of money, but she did say that was one of the proudest moments of our life. And we did write her a letter from the SG thanking her. So I think that that's one of the things that we really need to harness is to be able to take, and I mean, when you look about, think about open and openness in that very kind of broad way, these are the sorts of examples that you can achieve. And they're powerful and important. Yeah. I think when we, you know, when we, I love that example. I think when we're building, um, you know, open source software has come from a desire to fix problems, like just fix real world issues and real world problems. There's no reason why we can't uh, adapt, you know, use the exact same principles to solve, you know, non-software problems uh, yeah. or, or, you know, address those others. So I, th I think that, um, you know, that, that sort of thing is exactly, exactly where the power lies. Yeah. Um, I loved the fact that you used the word love earlier on because I think um, there's something really powerful there about how we um, sort of heal some of the rifts and the polarizing discussions that have gone on. And I think we can learn from, again, from open approaches that being inclusive, recognizing diversity, um, and diversity can mean cognitive diversity. Um, people think in different ways. And if we, if we open up who can um, collaborate with us to develop solutions, like your example there, you can, you know, you, you'll, you'll find um, somewhere, someone has that exact slant, slant that's going to help you, um, you know, to, to, um, to solve that, that, that challenge. Catherine, in terms of, of your work, um, I know you're, um, reasonably new to, to being CEO of, of uh, 
Creative Commons, um, but just in, in your, your um, work previously, are there any other examples of open collaboration and, and how you've harnessed that to, um, to address challenges? In, in, in terms of Creative Commons, we have had a long-standing open education programme, which is really important. And you can see the, 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 the real um, possibilities with open education and climate education and how those two are coming together. And that is an, also a, a big equity issue because open education resources, people can use them, they're free to reuse, they're, you're able to use them across the world. You can, you know, it's just an amazing movement that is there and clearly is challenging established models, just like Open has always challenged an established model. But I think now, you know, coming out of the pandemic, looking at the pressing problem of climate, thinking about it was Open Research that helped us kind of in record speed create a, a vaccine that, you know, in record time, we see these things that are happening around us and thinking about how we can utilize that to the best of our, you know, our, 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 for, for humanity really. Um, but at Creative Commons, we've got a global network. We have we just had our global summit and we had 91 countries represented. You know, that thriving movement of seeing why open content, open licensing is so critical, important. And we're celebrating this year our 20th anniversary. So it's a really lovely moment to reflect in the past and think about the future. And that's why we have got our theme this in terms of a strategy about better sharing, because we know that 20 years ago, we were created out of the, the phenomenon of field sharing online, and now we want to see things being done in a better way in terms of how we can share, um, because there's issues that have come up which we need to address, which you know were not there 20 years ago, and yet you know we have to think about that today. But that's what's so exciting, and that's what's wonderful about the open movement, is that you're able to address problems and questions of this moment to be able to find those solutions and to be able to work together. I think sharing is a really important point because whether um, whether any of us like it or not, what we say, what we do, what we do within our organisations is being shared. It's it's transparent. People are people have a, an opinion about what we do. Um, people will share things that they are upset about. You know, plastic pollution, brand audits. People are are finding out who are the who are the worst offenders for plastic pollution. So transparency um, that that principle of transparency will happen to us whether we want it to or not um, so being having having some control over that and sharing being deliberate being intentional about sharing about being inclusive about being open um, it actually makes sense and and you know from, from a, it, it it helps us to be part of the solution rather than feeling that we're going to, you know, that, that, that we're the victims of, of, of people, um, people's anger. Because there is a lot of anger out there. There's a, there's a lot of anger, understandably, for, for what has happened and, and what we're facing. So harnessing that, it's, it's really incumbent on everyone to do that. It makes sense for everyone to do that. Yeah, I, th I, think, um, I think Lord Ward earlier said something about, you know, publish the data and it will get, it will get, yeah. done, it will get cleaned up quicker. Yeah. And I kind of, I loved that, and I thought, you know, wouldn't that be great if actually we had, yeah. you know, organizations were able to do that, or, you know, country, yeah. you know, all, the, all the police were able to do that, and then you can sort of democratize the, the solution, like enable anybody to kind of like come and be a part of that solution. That'd be great. It's also very idealistic, because we, we don't live in a world where it's psychologically safe enough, or like, you know, financially on the market safe enough to say, hey, yeah, look, we, 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 we dropped this all out. So, I think we've got a long way to go on that, but yep. um, it, I'd, I'd love that world. I think you know. It's a, I know, it's and amazing. I think psychological safety is a really great term for that because I think that's um, that comes back to that idea of, of behaving from a, a, a point of love and from kindness. Um, psychological safety, so we can define that as feeling safe to be ourselves and not, you know, to iterate, to, to express ideas, to fail, to um, and and not to be. Um, not to be, not, not to experience prejudice against us for any defining characteristics, etc. And I think, um, I think that is going to be a very vital way, uh, thing for us to develop on, as, a, as the way forward is that we enable everyone to feel psychologically safe to contribute to the debate, including those organizations and industries that we, you know, that we know have been, have been part of creating the problem. We actually need that engagement right across the board. We need the protesters to come together 
with the people who've, who've created the problems. And we need to have that kind of mature conversation because those people working within those industries, there are huge numbers of skills, huge numbers of skills that help, can help us address these problems as well. So the, the polarization, I think we need to sort of get past that. It's, it's right that we protest, that we call things out, but we also now need to move into a, a kinder way of, of coming together, I think, so that we can connect in a psychologically safe way for... Yeah. Absolutely, just sort of being, you know, a bit of compassion and empathy towards yeah. each other would go a long way right yeah. now in the world, I think. Yeah. Um, and and that, that idea of, um, I think we've got to get better at being able to disagree, and that's okay, you know, it's okay to disagree, we're going to have lots of different ideas because they're complex problems, yeah. but being able to then commit as a group around actually taking some kind of action, even if you don't think it's the best form of action, is really important, and we, we have a you know we have a particular practice around that, and you know, you could there are steps there are steps that you can take that enable you to do that as a as a group. So, you know, it, you it encourages that greater inclusivity of like ideas to come in. That then you you at some point have to go well, what are we actually going to do? What are we going to coalesce around and, and and take action on? And the and the key there is really just about saying. Well, what evidence are we going to look for? What's the experiment we're running? What's the evidence we're going to look for? And when are we going to evaluate that to, to go? Because if you know that, oh, well, in a week's time or a, a month's time or a year's time, whatever that the appropriate period is, you're going to come back, look at the evidence, and then make an evidence-based decision to iterate towards, a, uh, towards the best solution, then you can get behind that. But when you think, well, it's just going to go off into this black hole, and I have no idea when we're ever going like, to get to have this conversation again, so we need to get it right now. So it's, that kind of, it, it's knowing that you can come back to that conversation and iterate beyond that, that that's really important. And again, it's something that we, we, use, um, we use a lot, lot of because we, we, we have a lot of ideas and a lot of you know, passionate people with you know, kind of those ideas. But you, you can never get to action without being able to do that sort of disagree and commit kind of, yeah. kind of piece. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open up to questions from the floor. Uh, we do have a roving mic, so if anyone does have a question, please put your hand up and um, we'll bring the mic to you. Or any thoughts on what's been discussed? Yep, thank you. So I think uh, a lot of us here, you know, familiar with open source and we're familiar with the benefits of cross-company collaboration and, and, you know, innovation gains, the fact that success doesn't have to be... Oh, is it? What's that? There we go. It's not a zero-sum game. How can we encourage industry, you know, to understand the values of open? How can we portray to, you know, people who aren't in this room that by opening up, they're not giving, they're not necessarily giving away success, they're helping to, you know, rising tide floats all the boats kind of approach. Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think, um, no, actually, no, go on, you, you go ahead, because I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the practice, it's about sharing by example, isn't it? And about showing why it matters. Show not tell. Yeah, and yeah. the other thing I, I thought is interesting to interlink into this, it is interesting just now, like the G7 are talking about open societies, the importance of open. That has started, that thread is coming in about the importance that is to society, which means it's important to businesses, it's important to us all. And I think how we link those things together is an opportunity to actually make sure that open is central to what we're saying about open societies, open democracy, op yeah. and, and how we do things. Sorry. No, 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 no I, I totally agree. I was going to say, you know, that one of our principles is show, not tell, because you can tell people as long as you like, but you never, you know, you, 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 you've got a chance of convincing them that, you know, you're still going to have plenty of detractors. One, once you're showing it and once you're, once you're demonstrating it again and again, then you, you tend to find those, those objections kind of start to melt away because people sort of realise they, they need to make that change themselves or that could work for them. So, um, yeah, I, and it might sound a bit simplistic, but show, not tell. Very, yeah, very much agree. I think case studies of, of uh, 
the principles and practice are really important um, because it can be quite an abstract notion for people. And, and we've certainly experienced um, people saying to us, well, we can't be open because we can't be open because we look after people's data, for example, and, and that's got to remain private. And there's a lack of understanding that open can be dialed up and down. It can be contextualized. You can always find a way to embed um, transparent approaches in, in other ways, for example, through how you provide access internally to documentation, how documentation is commented so that others can come in and catch themselves up on what's happening, provide feedback, provide feed in. You can, you can still engage with communities and get um, feed in from prospective users and customers, etc. So I think, um, I think it's a really good point. I think there's a lack of understanding about open approaches and open principles. And it would be very helpful to, to, expand on that, to expand on the education and awareness raising of that. Yes, sorry, sorry. So, I was just going to say, um, it's actually a really good time to do that. Because I think with the pandemic, this whole idea of kind of co-opetition has appeared. Um, because we had this common issue that we had to really come together and try to navigate, not solve, but navigate. And I think that there is appetite in industry now much more than perhaps you know, a decade ago, where there is willingness to try and collaborate, work together, be a bit more transparent. And just to that point of transparency, transparency is really in essential in, because we need to re-innovate trust. We've lost a lot of trust in institutions, and that's my generation. The younger generation, even more so, don't believe in institutions the way that we did. So I think we need to kind of re-engage and build that level of transparency and trust at this moment, it's a catalytic period for us, so we can really start demanding, expecting, and valuing the idea of transparency, honesty, openness, then hopefully industry will respond to that. But trying to engage with industry in a very directive way is extremely difficult to do. The only way to do it is really through legislation. Most member states, most governments would be very, very reluctant uh, to do anything like that. There are a number of resources as well that are available. Amanda, you know, has has been talking about, and the Open UK team have been talking about their reports um, that they have. Uh, Red Hat have a number of resources. The Open Organisation has has lots of, of free resources and and books and case studies of, of this in practice. So, um, yeah, I think, but I think it would be helpful to to keep going and keep expanding on that. Yeah, I I, I think that the. One of the things that I think there's a bit of a danger around is when we, we often talk about open culture. And um, I recently heard a bit of a backlash against like kind of talking about culture because people say, oh, thanks, you tell me I've, you know, our culture isn't, our culture's the problem. What am I meant to do with that? You know? And I think, I think we have to make that very practical because you know, culture ultimately is the, is, is a, so this is the shadow of what you do, right? how you behave, how, how things are done around here. That's how you kind of like make culture real. And in doing that, you know, you do that through the practices that you that you use to find solutions. So it comes down to like having those practices that embody those, the, you know, the transparency, inclusivity, collaboration, and adaptability, building communities around that practice, those practices as well, um, uh, to to do those effectively. And to the point of, you know, we have things that we we use. So we we use um, we started a, a a library of practices. So you can go and use these today, or you know, you go and you solve some problems with these things. And you know, it's not just software; it's you know, they can be applied anywhere. Um, and, and we then decided, well, it's not very open us keeping those to ourselves. So um, we built a community around that. So it's an open source community now, uh, and it's called the Open Practice Library. So you find it at openpracticelibrary.com, and there's a, a framework for for use of these um, practices and practices that will can help you on. You know, if you have a, an issue around kind of gaining alignment of, um, you know, a shared understanding of the problem or, you know, anything in sort of discovery right the way through to delivery or even kind of um, team cultural practices and so on, there's over 100 practices on there. So kind of go and use that. Um, let's say it's openpracticelibrary.com. Join the community. You can fork it, take it where you want it, you want it where you want to take it, or join the community and start, you know, adding in your practices, things that you use. Um, to that community, um, it's, it's, it's awesome. Thank you. That's great. Um, hello. Hi. So I really like 
the example of um, um, Salem gave where that problem was kind of fixed by a kind of but opening up to diverse communities. And what I'm wondering, what, one is that, you know, is that written up? Is that something um, that people can read about and find out about? But secondly, how do you encourage more governments, organizations, companies to really do that? I mean, you know, I think the COVID pandemic was a really good example where a lot of communities try to kind of um, collaborate and, and provide provide solutions to governments who were often like a bit overwhelmed, not sure, you know, what, what was good, what wasn't, and ultimately, you know, spent a lot of money with consultants that arguably didn't do a better job necessarily. So, you know, what are some of the considerations that make that kind of um, empowering and using open and open communities work, you know, in a, in a way that's positive, that's not exploitative, where you can find the better solutions, you know, should this be part, or is this part of the open practice library, for example? Um, but I'm just wondering, like, how how did that work? What are some of the, I guess, the tools and the um, principles that should be part of that, just to everyone? Salim, do you want to? Um, I can start. Um, so I, so we looked at the SDGs, all 17 of them, and we looked at how they interconnect. And of course, being techies, we used artificial intelligence to analyze hundreds of thousands of reports. The SDG that was really important in all of that was gender. So when you ask me, how do we really support that? We create an inclusive approach that really empowers women. And it really deals with that kind of unheard voice, not just from a gender perspective, but also from a global perspective, to be able to really start telling those kinds of stories, like the one that, you know, the, the one that I told is one of millions that are out there. So we really need to promote those, understand the value of those, and really be able to connect those to some sort of fundamental good that we can all commonly agree on. Um, trying to get industry mobilized is difficult because when you, uh, from my understanding of industry, and it's not by any means perfect because I haven't worked in industry, I've worked in the UN. Um, the objective of industry is not always seen historically as compatible with issues like sustainability, et cetera. However, that's increasingly begin, it's begun to be understood. So I think if we can really try to resonate and create a shared value perspective where industry can thrive, can do well, can engage, can be profitable, but also understand how that can happen in a positive way in uh, improving uh, sustainability, the climate, inclusivity. And those are the sorts of narratives that we've got to tell. Um, just in terms of the question of is that written up, yeah, so if you go to um, ideas.un.org, you'll find all that stuff there. We basically, so the UN and institutions like the UN aren't going to solve these problems. That's not really the intention, right? The intention of the UN is to bring people together, to create common voice, common ground, common direction of travel, multilateralism. So what we did from a technology perspective is we reached out. We created Unite, um, sorry, ideas.un.org. Um, I think that's what it is. In order to try and engage young people around the world. And that's where we did these Reboot the Earth, Reboot um, the Oceans, um, Reboot Health and Wellness, which we do with, did with the uh, World Health Organization to kind of find these solutions. Okay. You really ask an excellent question about, you know, kind of how that collaboration during the pandemic should have led really to much more, and yet, you know, there was just real challenges with that. And I, I, you made me think about, um, I, I did a kind of fireside chat, it, it was a keynote with um, Audrey Tang about Taiwan and how I think they really got it right and are still getting it right. And I think you look at how, you know, I think that was a month ago or so, and so, you know, they had, they had very, I think they had zero COVID cases because they openly shared the information, good and bad, out there to be able to, show to citizens what was happening on the ground and to be able to have that trust and they built trust through they use social media so effectively there and i just think there's there's something about that radically open approach that feeds into that g7 stuff about open societies and open democracy and about how you know we've got different ways of doing things that could be i think really effective um, both in building trust but also in actually delivering government and, gov you know, and good policies. So I just think you, you touched on some really good points, so thanks for sharing that with us. 
Um, I, sorry, if I could just continue this, um, and then we will have time for, I think, one more question. Um, for me, I've facilitated a lot of communities, um, and as soon as you don't have facilitation, the communities will not continue. So for me, actually, a core skill that we are going to have to um, enable, that we're going to have to um, fund and resource is facilitation. If you want collaboration, you need facilitation. Um, and there can be different models for how that works. It can be, you know, facilitation, resourcing can come from the public sector, it can come from private sector, can come from joint models. I've, I've um, contributed to projects which have had both, but I do think that's very important that we um, have a, a team or individual that will um, enable that collaboration to, and, and the community to, to continue and to make sure that it, it, um, that it works in, in, a, in a fair and equitable way. Sorry, just to end the, hopefully it's oh. not the last question, if that's okay. Sure, we had a hand over here. Oh. We, can, we can do two, yeah, okay, okay. that's fine. Thank you. Um, maybe just a, being a bit of a devil advocate here, but um, I think everyone, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we are thinking here that at the moment the focus is uh, very much top down. You know, larger companies uh, demonstrating good open, you know, collaboration, but realistically, that's that's not going to solve all the problems. And that, what are your thoughts on? the small medium businesses that have to also do that open collaboration, who's going to show them? And obviously their excuse is, oh, these big companies have lots of money and that's their focus is profit, profit, profit. And is that going to be a mindset that we're going to have to try and change? It's not all about profits, it's about, you know, building up your community, building up your nation, as it were. And how do you see these large institutes or companies or the UN and focusing on the people who don't have as much access to this money, well, finance to do so, is it the grassroots that we have to look at? If you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll respond. First of all, um, I did a survey for a, a company that was looking to um, have open collaboration to their, their open source platform. And we surveyed potential collaborators, and we um, found that the, the number one, by far, response as to why people would give their time for free to help this organization was because their, their values aligned with the values of that organization. So I think when we, um, again, this is part of the whole discussion about how opening up our values, opening up what we do, being um, willing to, to put data out there about who we are, what we're trying to do, which can be daunting. I mean, nobody wants to, like Lord Maud was saying, nobody really wants to, to show we've not, we've not got this absolutely perfect yet. So we need to be a bit more kind around that. But when you do that, you allow people to see your values and you allow them then to align with you and, and to, to, give, um, to give support. Um, I think also, you know, there are a number of open resources out there, um, openly licensed resources as well. So um, there, there are means for uh, organizations that may not have the financial wealth of, of others to still um, to find out how, to, how others have done this, to learn from, from this in practice, to, to gain from the open practice library, for example. Does anyone else want to, to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I think that um, if we just go from top down, it's not going to work. I think that's why, you know, you, you, in, um, you sort of need to democratise that. So you need to kind of get the communities to get together. Um, and actually, that, that will start to put pressure on organisations. And, you know, being, if you want to put a cynical hat on, you can say, well, actually, some of those organisations will see the opportunity to back something, you know, whether that's from a CSR point of view or, or whatever. So you know, you, you'll have a number of different motivators, but ultimately, if it goes in the right direction, that's a good thing. So um, getting people involved and enabling people to take action and, and then being able to show the results of that starts to build that, that, that drive and uh, other people wanting to, to get on board with that and corporations and, and enabling people to make a difference. 
And I think when people feel like they make a difference, they want to continue doing that. Um, so uh, however we can facilitate that is, is, the, is the key. So I'm very much from a grassroots point of view, if you want to change something, you won't change it top down. It just, just never really works. So it's got, to come from, it's got to come from the bottom up and be supported from the top down. And you, you're going to get that over time if you, um, you know, if, if organizations see that their employees are getting involved in some of these things, they're going to want to start to back that because they want to, you know, uh, you know so it's a good, good way of keeping people in some class. Any other thoughts before we go to the, the final question? Yep, there's a gentleman over there in the red. Thank you. Hi, um, the clock is ticking. How can we actually speed the open collaboration? Uh, and to use Salim's uh, 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 quotation sort of on the, we need to walk fast, but we need to walk together. You know, I, I, it, how can, what can we do? Because there isn't a lot of time to go and educate, whether it's governments, whether it's industries. What can we do to actually get people to collaborate in the open as quickly as possible? So, so I think what I was hearing is that how can we get people to, to start collaborating fast? We need to make these changes quickly. Any, any thoughts? Um, just very briefly, just going back to the previous question, I think it very much connects. Um, I totally agree. It has to be done at the, from the ground up, so it has to be bottom up and top down. It, we can't rely on large corporate institutions to wake up and have a kind of moment of, oh my God, we've got to do something. Uh, member states as well, you know, they're driven by other kind of imperatives. Um, so the way to walk fast, if there is such a thing, and together, is really to try from the ground up, because I think collectively we have a common aspiration, a common wish, a common desire to see the planet, you know, come back to where it should be. Um, so I think that's what we've got to really nurture. Now, I agree with you. Um, to try and advocate and share information and bring people on board and innovate trust and try to create that transparency, that does take time. But that's something that we really ought to have started a decade ago. But you know that old saying, um, you know, when's the, best, when the, when's the best time to plant a tree? 50 years ago. When's the second best time? Today. So that's what we've got to really kind of come together and, uh, and work on. Um, I, d I don't believe... I'm... I'm I'm interested in a hopeful narrative. I'm not interested in a doom and gloom narrative. I'm not saying that I think everything will be perfect and we'll all be fine, but I don't think that's the narrative that we should be embodying, particularly as the young people come along. And the other thing that I'll just go back to that, um, um, is, is important is there's a lot of polarization in the world and there's a lot of anger. If we confront anger with anger, nothing will happen. What we've got to do, and that's where we really need to be strong, is we need to confront anger with love, understanding, compassion. And if we can manage to do that, and if we can manage to come from the bottom up, if we can bring people together, if we can kind of create large-scale understanding, commitment, movement, then that bottom-up approach will start tilting the balance to the top down. But, that, but it's, it's, it's easy to say, but it's very, very, very difficult to do. Um, but I think certainly here, and I look at it from a global perspective. Here in the UK, a lot of the kind of cultural values, a lot of the kind of notions of togetherness community exist. And they've existed for decades and decades. So this is really a good place to start that kind of approach. Thank you. Yep. And look, you know, we, we have an army of advocates here, right? We all see the power of open. We all see, so go and join a community. Go and help and support a community and share what you know help them to, to, to you know, use the practices, use, the, use these you know, characteristics, et cetera, help, help, help those communities grow. You know, we're an army of advocates here, so let, let's, let's do our job, do, you know, play our part in that. I think that, that kind of partnership working also recovers, it re requires love, kindness, and also patience. Yeah. But I think those combinations, those qualities together, just think, you know, you can achieve something on your own, but together you can achieve so much more but it does take that time and that patience to be able to do that together. It's the right thing to do. I, yeah, completely agree. And, and just to finish off, um, I think that there's a lot of anxiety, um, I, I, you know, that exists about the climate crisis. But when we do something, 
whatever it is, when we would take some control and ownership of that, then um, we, we, we take back some control of it and we actually make things happen. So, um, yeah, so hand over to Amanda, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a, a really brilliant panel. I love the fact that social justice got brought into it. In this room a week ago, I met a hero of mine, Helena Kennedy QC, who was talking about the women she's been trying to help get out of Afghanistan and opening up data around that and how that was helping to do this. And from a personal perspective, the fact that we can take some optimism and share it with love and find ways to enhance and engage more with our communities, I, I think is the message that I'm gonna take away personally from this panel. And in that spirit of love, it's time to break bread with you. We have a vegan meal for you. At the Catering Dome, we'll only be serving vegan food. Everything is um, gluten-free also. We have bento boxes from the Catering Dome, but feel free to take them through the Welcome Dome, find a spot on site. The Zen Zone is still there if you want some quiet time. Uh, I've mentioned the Arctic Base Camp, which is at the back, great to, to experience. Femi is looking for help over lunch. He's looking for some of you to input into his sensor project. Uh, we have face painters. Now I'm really interested to see who's gonna go for the face painters. And I think all that remains for me to say is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Normally I'd do three, but I'm doing four because there are four amazing people in this panel. So thank you all. Please join with me in saying thank you. Thank you.